Our scripture this morning we're going to read is from Psalms, chapter 66. I'm going to read verses 16 through 20, but I'm going to start with the first four verses of Psalm 66, because I think it really leads us into to verse 16. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Verse 16. Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God surely has listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Good morning. You know, it's been said that God has three answers to every prayer. Yes, no, and wait a while. And the Bible is filled with how God continues to demonstrate this and, and give yes to the prayers. You look at people in the Old Testament like Jacob, Gideon, Hannah, David, and Ezra. People in the New Testament like Jesus, his son, Paul, and Peter. These people begged God in earnest intercessions and the Lord answered their prayers, right? Yet the Bible also tells us about how God has also said no to a number of prayers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8, Paul tells, uh, the great apostle Paul tells us that he prayed three times to God, that God would remove a thorn in his side. But in chapter 12 and verse 9, we read that God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, Moses, he begs God to let him enter into the promised land. You know, Psalm 22, the psalmist goes on to say, God, why is thy ear so hard from hearing me? You know, and for honest with ourselves, sometimes isn't that how we feel? We're going through a time in life where we're not exactly sure of how to move forward. I'm in a situation where I don't know what to do, God. I'm feeling an aching and a pain in my heart that, that I don't know how to work through. And God, it seems like I'm begging, but I don't, I don't know if your ear is so close to hearing my prayer. You know, the psalmist would say in Psalm 22 that sometimes that may exactly be how you and myself feel. That God, did you hear me? God, don't you love me enough to, to see this prayer through? Don't you know how much I really need for you to be here for me in this situation? Maybe you prayed that in your life you would have married a certain somebody. Maybe you've prayed in your life that you'd be able to pursue a certain job occupation or move to a different city or, or whatever it may be that you prayed a prayer and ultimately God said no. How many of us, that was funny, this topic came up right, before, right after our, our Bible class, um, but one of the sisters said, you know, what was, what was the greatest mistake that any of us made the beginning of this year, 2020? Well, she asked me that, and I said, I don't know. She said, went out and bought a planner. <laughs> How many of us had great goals this year? Did anybody have plans to travel this year? Show of hands. Anybody have plans to, to, per, to pursue something in their life that, man, this, this was finally the year that I'm able to? Maybe, maybe I've just retired, and, and, or maybe I've saved up enough, up enough money. Maybe I've done all these things in, in 2020. 2020 vision, you know, that was on every preacher's uh, sermon list. 2020 vision. And how many of us were able to do those things that we set out, wrote in our planner, and did the things that we're able to do today? Anybody? Well, I can, I can say that several of us, we had ours. Luckily, we hit Disney World before they shut down everything. So again, that wasn't on our list, but it just happened by God's grace. And so I want us to think about those times. Think about the times, and I don't mean for this mood to be melancholy where we're all lying low, but I want us to get into the heart of the message this morning. The title, I've given several different titles. Originally, this was preached as, thank you, Lord, for not answering my prayer. And not answering my prayer, I don't mean that God didn't hear it. He is a God that hears all. He's a God that knows all. He is without a limit. 
pertaining to his knowledge. But God, thank you for saying no for that one thing I said I really wanted. You know, last night, I don't know about you, but Crystal and I took our kids out and we took them trick-or-treating down the neighborhood in, um, in Chandler. And they filled their buckets up and they were great. We only had to hit three neighborhoods and we had filled up their buckets, which is a win-win for both of us. We can get back home and uh, we can finish watching the Ohio State game and Penn State game. You know, and all those things, we get back and, and they were just so eager to eat the candy. They were like, you know what, we went out, we were able to fill this up and we got home and Kenley, our second youngest, she was like, you know, daddy, can, can I open, can I eat my candy now? It's like, we haven't even eaten dinner, Kenley. No, you can't. And as she always does, and she's so good at it, especially with grandma and grandpa, she'll melt down. You know, her eyes is like that, just gets so big, and the little tear covers the bottom part of her eye, and her bottom lip, qu- lip quivers, and, and you know, I'm like, sorry, Kenley, we're not, you've, you've tried that too many times. You've exhausted my falling into that trap. I'm not going to do it. And so the answer was, No. Can you remember a few times where you were, Kenley, yourself in prayer? Maybe you were brought to your knees and you had no strength to get up off the ground. Maybe you're sitting by a loved one in a, in a hospital room and it doesn't look good. It doesn't look like they're going to make it out. Maybe you're sitting there in your living room and you're looking around at your family and you're seeing, I just don't know how we're going to get out of this financial situation we're in. God, I need you to come through for me. Well, what happens when the prayer that you've given up to God, you've delved within you to get all out, all, every ounce of your strength up to send the prayer to God and, and only come to realize that the answer is no. What do you do then? What do we do with the year like 2020? My job up here is to encourage you to keep pressing on for the Lord and, and I can't help but do that Without relaying to you, I understand this year has been tough for us. As a missionary and a missionary family on the ground, I can tell you, I know we're going through some tough times this year. And so what else can we do? In my mind, I'm thinking, but go to some places in Scripture where people feel exactly as we do this year. Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 3. We're going to discuss this idea of when God denies the prayer of his children. And I want us to search search scripture this morning as to why. We don't always know why God does what he does, and that's okay, and we need to learn to be okay with that. But there are certain areas where we see a situation and God gives us the answer plain as day. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, starting in verse 23, the Bible says, I also pleaded with the Lord. At that time, saying, this is Moses speaking, O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness, your strong hand, and for what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Let me, I pray, cross over and see the fair land that is beyond the Jordan, that good hill country in Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me, on your account and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, Enough. Speak to me no more of this matter. Moses goes on to say in verse 27 that he's told to go up to the Mount of Pisgah, lift your eyes up to the west and the north and south and the east and see it with your own eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan, but charge Joshua... And encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go across at the head of this people, and he will give them as an inheritance to the land which you will see. God, don't you see all the good that I've done? I went out, I went into the land of Egypt, I I stood up to Pharaoh, the greatest, most powerful man in all of the world. I told him to lead your let your people go. I even led them across dry, dry land. I brought them here. Can't you just let me just cross over the Jordan to see see the land of Canaan? What's God's response? No, you may not. And really in a harsher way than that. Other than Jesus, Moses might be the most well-known person in all of the Bible. Arguably the greatest of all the Jewish prophets. 
Somebody who came to face to face with our Lord as he was represented in the burning bush, you might recall in Exodus 3. Moses, somebody who was chosen by God to deliver his people out of Egyptian bondage, Exodus 14. Moses, somebody who God used to deliver his covenant vows to the Hebrew nation, Exodus 19. So why did God deny that prayer of Moses? If you agree, like me, I'd say he's pretty worthy. I mean, I understand he's got a lot of flaws, but this man was a great man for you, God. Why did he deny the prayer? For this, we have to go to Numbers chapter 20. So turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 20, please. Numbers chapter 20, starting in verse number 1. The Bible says, Then the sons of Israel, the whole congregation, came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed at Kadesh. Now Miriam died there and was buried there. There was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. And the people thus contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why then have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die here? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us into this wretched place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there water there to drink. Then Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of the meeting and fell on their faces. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses and saying, Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the rock. Notice what he's supposed to do specifically. Speak to the rock before their eyes, that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock, and let the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, just as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth the water for you out of this rock? Can you sense the frustration out of Moses? Like, oh my goodness. In Navajo, we would say, Ya Allah, you know, oh, get over here, whining again. Okay, get over here, let me do what I, what I need to do to give you water. He sensed the irritation out of his voice. But the, uh, verse 11, then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod and water came forth abundantly and the congregation and their beasts drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly, these people into the land which I have given them. There's the consequence. So if we understand why God, at first we would be like, man, God, that's pretty harsh. You're not letting, you know, this great man, uh, Moses, go into the promised land. Well, when we understand why, now we see. Why was he not able to do it? First of all, in verse 8, God specifically told him to speak to the rock. The Bible says it was because also in verse 12, you have not believed in me. Isn't that interesting? You are lacking faith. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19, the Hebrew writer goes on to say that they, Aaron and and Moses, they could not enter because of their unbelief. God wanted to display his power to the children of Israel. And unfortunately, Moses didn't allow him to do that. If Moses, the leader of the entire tribe of Israel, would not humble himself to the Lord God, have faith in God that he would do what he said he would do, how were those who were supposed to follow him as a leader going to do it as well? You know, a lot of times we say, well, well, I'm not sure that, that God's, you know, I'm not sure he's hearing me. I'm not sure he really understands how much I need this to happen. Is he hearing my cry? Well, if we look at Moses' account, if I'm leading souls, how good of a steward have I been with my leadership to folks? How good have I been with, with people knowing that they're following me and I'm the one there, like Moses, without unbelief, disobediently and saying, here you go, God, that's what you get, out of frustration. 
If we go on to verse 10, we go back to verse 10, it says, And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. And what did Moses say to the people? He says, Listen now, you rebels, shall we? You sense a sense of pride there. Let me and Aaron be the one to do this for you again. Certainly pride must have been that to an extent. Must we bring forth the water for you out of this rock, referring to himself and Aaron? And so one could say that he was usurping God's place as himself. Completely unacceptable. And so looking back at our denied prayers to say, why did God answer no? Could it be that we fell into this category? Could it be that my prayer was a selfish prayer? That's a big one. James chapter 4 and verse 3, James says, You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Why are you praying your prayer? What's the motivation for? If God says yes, who is it going to benefit? Just you? Second thing, was my prayer not according to the will of God? 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14 says, This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Or could it be that my unbelief and my disobedience is hindering my prayers? Psalm 66, 17 through 20, the brother just read that. He says, I cried out to him with my mouth. But his praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. John chapter 9 and verse 31, John says, We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, God hears him. Amen? And so there's more to the picture of when we receive a no. Kenley, baby, I'm sorry you can't eat candy. You know why? Because I want to see your teeth in your mouth for a few more months. I, I don't want it to just rot and fall out. I love your beautiful smile. Well, God, why can't I have this and this and this? Could you imagine spiritually what we would look like if every, every prayer, the answer was yes? What would you and I look like if every prayer that we lifted up to God was a yes? We would be spoiled brats, wouldn't we? I mean, I mean, one of the greatest things that I'm told, I've, I've read in, in, in psychological reviews and, and people who, who, who have an education and degrees in, in rearing up children, one of the greatest things that you can do for your children is tell them no. Because if they're so governed by their, um, I'm going to get it and I know it and, and I'm going to receive a yes, imagine when they grow older and they finally get hit with a no from other people. Imagine how torn down they'll be. Imagine how caught off guard they'll be. So you think the father of fathers, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, knows what he's doing when he tells us no? Amen. I think he does. So that's one instance. I want us to look at an even more powerful, if you could imagine that, a greater example of when the father denied somebody. Turn to Mark chapter 14 for a New Testament example for our second point. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, we're told about the time that Jesus is on his, well, he's, he's been, he's been uh, Judas has, has betrayed him, and Jesus is in the garden, and he's praying to the Father, and I don't know if you've ever necessarily studied this out in depth, but it's probably one of the passages that most impacted my life because of what took place. I also had to write a 10-page paper on it in school, so that also might be a part of it. In Mark chapter 14, God the Father denies God the Son. Think about that. God the Father denies another part of the Godhead, God the Son. I mean, thinking about that very basic statement that has profound implications, it should bring you and, I to, you and, you and myself to our knees. Who am I to curse God and blame him for a time he says no to my prayer when the very son that he sent to save you and I from our sins was also told no in the garden. Amen. Who am I? Amen. In Mark chapter 14, we'll begin in verse 32. It says that they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, 
sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray. Pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. There's his first prayer. And he was saying, verse 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but you will. The second time he's asked this in prayer. Verse 37, And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep, for, for, keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, verse 39, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. You think this meant a lot to our Lord? Three times he prayed the same prayer. And what was that prayer? God, if there's any other way you could do this without me having to go and do that, can you please do it that way? Three times he prayed this prayer in the garden. We notice the fear and the vulnerability. We notice the anxiety of Christ. A lot of us can empathize with that right off the bat. I remember sitting in, in, the, in the hospital room with a child laying on the bed that you know is probably not going to pull through. I remember that time. I remember the time pleading with God saying, you know what, God, whatever you need to do, let me know what I need to do as a father. I will do it. If you just heal my son back to health. You've prayed those prayers in your life. You've begged God. You've been filled with anxiety. You've been so overcome with fear. It's like your sweat turns into blood. You can empathize with that. His prayer not to have to go through with this was not given once, not twice, but three times. So we know it meant so much to our Lord. His friends have left him. They can't even keep watch. So not only is, is he filled with all that, all that anxiety and worry, he's basically alone. His, his best friends, they can't even do what they need to do. The people who once chanted, Hosanna, Hosanna, laying their coats on the floor in, in Mark 11, they've all deserted him. Our Lord is isolated. He's alone. Can we empathize with that in 2020? Have we been isolated? Have we probably felt alone? Absolutely. All he has is his father, and he pleads with him three times not to go through with this. Verse 40 gives us our answer to his prayer. The Bible says, And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. How do we know this is his answer? Verse 43. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Our Lord got his answer to his prayer that he prayed three times in the garden when he lifted his eyes up and he saw those sinners who were going to come and take him away in chains. His answer was no. And what I believe really truly marks the, the epitome of a disciple is what do I do when my God tells me no? How do I receive that answer from God? Do I sit down, pout like a child in the middle of an aisle, cry my, my eyes out and point to God and say, this is your fault? Or do I get up, shake it off, move forward? I may not know why, but I know he does. Amen. And keep pushing on because I'm not God. I think that's something we need to be reminded of from time to time. Why? Why was Jesus' prayer denied? We do have the answer to this. Number one, because it was not part of God's will. I feel like we read that somewhere. 
John chapter 6 and verse 38, Jesus says, For I have not come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who, what? Sent me. That's why he was not able to, to, to be given a yes. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul says, Being found in appearance as a man, Jesus Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So number one, it was because it wasn't part of God's will. But secondly, it was because God the Father had a greater plan. Amen. Have you ever considered that? Why did God say no to my prayer? Well, might it be because he has a greater plan for you? Amen. That has to involve you being denied this prayer. Say, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. The Bible gives us an account and tells us what had been accomplished through the denial of the prayer, in that Christ could fulfill and do his complete work on the cross. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Starting in verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Paul says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as all in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But to each in his own order, Christ, the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he, is a, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Amen. Verse 26. The last enemy that will be abolished is what? Death. Death. So the greater plan, the reason why the father said no to the son, is because death, the greatest power that Satan yielded, that had to be abolished. How was that going to be abolished? Because Jesus Christ had to go to the cross to die and be buried and raised up again. Amen. That's how God was going to abolish the greatest weapon that Satan has against mankind. Do you see the picture now? The reason why he was told no is because there was a greater plan. There was a greater outcome that would affect not just you and me, but all of the world that were willing to obey the gospel. He says in verse 27, For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted those who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God, God may be all in all. Do you know why God the Father said no to God the Son? It's so that death would be abolished, which is why Paul can say in verse 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why he was told no in the Garden of Gethsemane. So what do we take away from these just two examples? Moses, what a great prophet, did mighty works of God. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who was sent to save us from sin... Both told no because God had a greater plan for both of them. So we can't forget that what makes God, God, is the fact that he is omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's everywhere at once. That means that there is nothing that God does not know. His knowledge is infinite. And ours is. So when God tells me no, how should I receive it? I should receive it with humility. I know nothing. I should receive it with faith, saying he has a plan. I should receive it with fear and reverence because Evan Todicini is not God. He is merely a servant of him. You know, some of the greatest blessings in our life can be denied prayers. 
I thought I really wanted something until God came and squashed that dream right out under me. And that's okay. Oscar Wilde once said, when the gods wish to punish us, they answer our prayers. Another person said, oh God, save us from all of our desires. Now you think you understand why Paul says that there's a war that's being waged in our, against our soul? It's our flesh. The flesh, the, the sin, the, the, the pride of life, the, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh. And, and thank, thanks be to God that in John, 1 John chapter 2, he says, when that day comes, when our Lord returns, those will no longer bother us. Those will be wiped away along with the earth. Can you think of a day when we will no longer be hindered by the desires of our flesh? That day is coming, church. That day is coming, and it's all made possible because God told our Lord no. He exercised the denial of denying that prayer. So the next time I realize that God has given me a no, and maybe if, if, if you're like me, he, he does that a lot from time to time. Trying to say, God, oh God, we could do this, 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 this. Guess what? No, no, and no, you're going to do this. One of the things that you're aware of that we had this great idea, Josh and I, you know what, what we can do at the Salt River, we're right down the road from ASU and MCC and Scottsdale. Guess what we can do? We can start a college ministry. Let's do it. So all of our prayers, all of our resources, time and energy, it went to establishing a college, um, a college ministry. It was like we were a, a vehicle, a four by four, stuck in the mud and we're spinning our tires. All the while, we have a ministry from the Salt River Pima Reservation, Journey to Recovery calls and says, hey, would you want to come in and, and, and teach our clients, those who are trying to get out of addictions, would you like to teach them and talk with them? But you only have to teach Bible, okay? You got it. Hey, you got the rule. You set the rules. That'd be fine. We didn't do anything. Guess what? Fell on our lap. We didn't do anything, but word spread on the reservation. Pretty soon, we were asked to go into the prison on the, on the Salt River Pima reservation. And we were getting six hours of study with inmates, all natives. Is there any other place that you could, you could imagine we would rather be? Six hours a week, all native audience teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We didn't do one thing to get that. So you think there's knowledge in God's denial to our prayers? Absolutely. All we can do is say, yes, sir, keep on moving and know that he's God and not me. So if you've been struggling with this idea of being denied prayers, God's saying no. Well, God, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to work through this? I hope this has been encouragement to you. You know, it's something for one, it's one thing for a child to be denied candy. But I'll tell you what, fellas, if you look to your wife and you tell her no one of these days, Imagine that's how, how that's going to be. I tried to tell my grandma no one time because, again, we're, the virus is, is up there on the reservation and she's not allowed to be out and about. You try to tell a grandma no, it's not going to be good for you. I don't care if we're talking about children or you're an elder that's been around the block a few times. We do not like the word no. And sometimes that pride can get, in, get into the thick of it. It can cause our faith to become lackluster. It could cause our faith to become, you know, I'm disobedient to God, and maybe I begin to harden my heart. But when I go back and I humble myself, and I look at some of the greatest men that's ever lived, like Moses, like Jesus, to understand that they also got told no, but it was for a reason. Now do you think I'm okay with it? I hope so. So church, I pray that this has been encouragement to you. If 2020 has been a, a bad year for you, guess what? It's been a bad year for all of us. But we have what the world does not. We have a vision. We have a goal. We have a leader. You know, I'm reminded of the Gospels when it talks about Peter and how Peter was walking on water and his ability to do that is because his eyes were fixed on his master. Well, when he started to take his eyes off and he noticed, man, that's, real, that's some really big rain and hail. Man, the wind's really blowing. It's really dark. He began to sink. When we become too overcome with our worries, things out of our control, and we lose sight on our Lord, we will begin to sink. We've got to keep our eyes perfected on our Lord and Master who has finished the race. 
He is at the finish line. And just like the Hebrew writer says, we're running through. We're almost at the finish line. And it's like everybody of long ago are sitting in the stands and they're cheering us on. Don't stop. You're almost there. I see the finish line. You're almost, do not give up. Church, do not give up. Keep going. Know that God is in control. You see all around you all the works that you're a part of. God is working in every one of these places. He's doing things that you and I could never imagine to do. So my encouragement this morning is to know that he's in control. Even when it seems that, that we're down and out, guess what? We're on the team that wins. We've chosen to be on the team that is victorious. If there's a need for anybody this morning, please come. If you have not obeyed the gospel, then you are not on the winning team yet. The Bible says that there's a process for one to enter into that team. You are to hear the gospel preached. You just did that just now. Either you believe or not believe. If you believe it, you accept it, repent of your sins. You confess the Lord uh, with your mouth and then you're baptized into Christ. Romans chapter 6, Paul says you're raised up a new creation, a brand new baby. And that is the greatest decision you will ever make in your life. When the world has passed away and you're a soul and you see and your knee is bowing to the king of all kings, you will never regret the decision to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who denied it and those who chose to pass over it, they will regret that moment their entire lives that go on for eternity. I love you. I know this church loves you. There's several people who can study with you. If you have any needs, please come as we stand and we sing our invitation song.